Brickyard 4467, wind 200 at 10, zero, zero, runway 31 left at Kilo Echo, clear for takeoff. <laughs> In August 1939, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt informing him of the discovery of nuclear fission and the possibility of its being harnessed to create a bomb the likes of which the world has never seen. In his letter, Einstein provided evidence that Germany was attempting to construct such a nuclear bomb. President Roosevelt heeded the warning and formed the Uranium Committee to determine the feasibility of a nuclear chain reaction. At the time, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was still two years away. The immediate concern was Germany and Adolf Hitler. Three years later, in August 1942, the American nuclear effort was consolidated into the Manhattan Project, but Allied victory in Europe came two months before the successful detonation of a nuclear device. This detonation, known as the Trinity Test, occurred on July 16, 1945. Germany had already been defeated, but the bloody war in the Pacific was still raging. The state of war was as follows. Japan was surrounded by Americans in the Pacific, but still had a formidable army defending the homeland and they refused to surrender. A bloody American invasion of mainland Japan was starting to look inevitable. But President Harry Truman, who inherited the remnants of World War II from President Roosevelt, suddenly had a means to end the war with minimal American casualties. Truman was aware of the short and long-term implications of his choice, but he made the decision to use the atomic bomb against Japan. On the same day as the Trinity test, a secret crate was loaded onto the USS Indianapolis in San Francisco. We have since learned that the crate contained components of the Little Boy atomic bomb, but it is unclear if even the ship's captain, Charles McVeigh, knew what the secret cargo was. But there were at least two people on board who did know, James Nolan and Robert Furman. These two men were aboard the Indianapolis on Manhattan Project business, but since the mission was shrouded in secrecy, Nolan and Furman were disguised as artillery officers. The disguise was not very convincing though. Nolan, who had no military experience, could not answer basic questions or discuss artillery or the army, and constantly had to disappear to tend to the little boy components below deck. After a quick stop at Pearl Harbor to refuel, the Indianapolis made it to Tinian Island without incident. Here, the two men with the Manhattan Project disembarked the Indianapolis with their mysterious cargo on July 26, 1945. If the crew of the Indianapolis was not curious before, they were when Noland and Furman were greeted by a surprising number of high-ranking officials on Tinian Island. The Indianapolis left Tinian Island the same day for Guam. The ship was then ordered to sail for the Philippines. For that voyage, Captain McVeigh requested an escort, but his request was declined. Once the components of the little boy were safe and sound on Tinian Island, President Harry Truman issues the Potsdam Declaration, warning Japan of, quote, prompt and utter destruction, if the country does not surrender unconditionally. Japan rejects the Potsdam Declaration, and so technicians on Tinian begin assembling the components of the Little Boy atomic bomb. Meanwhile, the USS Indianapolis is making way for the Philippines. She is spotted by Japanese submarine I-58. Moments later, two torpedoes strike the ship. The Indianapolis was nearly torn in half by the explosions. The ship is sinking rapidly. 1,200 men on board scramble. 300 men are killed on board and go down with their ship 12 minutes after their torpedo struck. 900 men make it into the water, but their plight was only beginning. Help was not on the way. For those who managed not to drown, dehydration, starvation, and hallucinations set in, and it was not long before white-tipped sharks swarmed the wreck site to feed on the dead. The survivors were terrorized by the sharks as they baked in the Pacific heat, waiting for nightfall. When night did come and the air became cold, they prayed for daybreak. Eventually, the circling sharks went from bumping the men to biting them. Terrified and suffering, the survivors did not know if they would ever be saved. Back on Tinian, the little boys assembled, but the mission is on hold due to a typhoon. While waiting for the storm to pass, the logistics of the mission are planned. Colonel Paul Tibbetts is selected as the pilot of the modified B-29 aircraft which would drop little boy. He selected his crew, and six other B-29 superfortresses are ready to support the mission. Three aircraft would fly ahead of the bomb aircraft to assess the weather in the three target cities. Two aircraft would stand by in Iwo Jima, ready to take over if necessary. The last two B-29s would accompany Tibbet's plane as observation aircraft. On August 2nd, the pilot of an American bomber on anti-submarine patrol spots the survivors of the Indianapolis and radios his base from which a seaplane is sent to drop life-saving supplies to the men in the water. But the pilot of the seaplane notices the sharks attacking survivors and perilously lands his plane on the water, in violation of his orders. While taking on survivors, the pilot radios for more help. 
only 317 victims survive. On Tinian Island, special bombing mission number 13 is ready to begin. Colonel Tibbetts names the bomb aircraft Enola Gay after his mother and against the will of its regular pilot. 15 minutes after midnight on August 6, 1945, the crews take a moment to pray before boarding their aircraft for their world-changing mission. At 0137, the three weather planes, Jabot 3, Full House, and Straight Flush, take off and head for their respective target cities. The three potential targets are, in order of preference, Hiroshima, Kokura, and Nagasaki. At 0245, Enola Gay rolls down the runway. Loaded with a 10,000-pound little boy atomic bomb, the B-29 uses all two miles of the runway to rotate. Right after, the two observation aircraft, the Great Artiste and Necessary Evil, take off and follow Enola Gay. Fifteen minutes into the flight, Captain William Parsons informs Tibbets that he and his team are going to start arming the bomb. The arming process was complete before the Enola Gay arrives at Iwo Jima, the rendezvous point, at 0600. From the rendezvous point, the three planes set course for Japan and climb to an altitude of 9,300 feet. An hour and a half later, the pilot of Straight Flush sends a coded message to Tibbets informing him of acceptable weather conditions in Hiroshima and advises Tibbets to bomb the primary target. Tibbets climbs to an altitude of 31,000 feet and sets a course for Hiroshima. At 0905, Hiroshima comes into view from the cockpit of Enola Gay. Down in the city, a radio station informs its listeners that three planes have been spotted approaching Hiroshima. From the Great Artiste, a Manhattan Project scientist drops two pressure gauges attached to the parachutes. 58 seconds later, the Bombay doors on Enola Gay pop open, and just like that, little boy falls away. The nose of the Enola Gay rises 10 feet before it can be retrimmed after shedding 10,000 pounds. Tibbets immediately banks hard to the right and races away from the doomed Hiroshima. At 0916, Little Boy fell to an altitude of 1968 feet, triggering its detonation. The explosion reaches 500,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Tail gunner Bob Karen sees the explosion from 11 miles away. Three shockwaves strike Enola Gay, which makes a series of strange sounds as a result. The mushroom cloud forms, peaking at half a mile high. Enola Gay circles the city three times before sending a coded message to base informing them of the successful mission. By the time the planes land on Tinian, the mission had lasted 12 hours and 13 minutes. Little Boy instantly killed as many as 166,000 people. Emperor Hirohito received a report calling for unconditional surrender based on the Potsdam Declaration, but the Emperor refuses. When the decision is made to continue to bomb Japanese cities, Manhattan Project scientists scramble to assemble the Fat Man bomb. Procedures are skimmed and checks are skipped during assembly. Fat Man is fully assembled on August 8th. The next night, Fat Man is loaded onto another modified B-29 called Boxcar. If the first bombing mission was smooth, the second was destined to be the opposite. The weather was bad, so the rendezvous point was changed to Yakushima and the cruising altitude raised to 17,000 feet. This would result in higher fuel consumption. The pre-flight check occurs in the dark at 0215 and results in the discovery of a broken fuel pump. One of the tanks, which held 640 gallons of fuel, was useless. Protocol was not to fly, but the crew knew how temperamental B-29s were. They hesitantly decided to go ahead with the mission. This time, Enola Gay, along with Lagan Dragon, takes off as a weather plane at 0258. The potential targets are Kokura, Nagasaki, and Niigata. At 0910, the weather planes report that the weather in Kokura Borderline, but acceptable. Kokura is their target city. Suddenly, a red light on the fat man started to blink rapidly. Lieutenant Philip Barnes awakened a sleeping Dick Ashworth. Startled by what he was told, Ashworth jumped into action. He informed the crew that the bomb was armed and would detonate if the plane descended below a certain altitude. Referring to the blueprints, Ashworth was able to fix the problem quickly, saving the mission and the crew. Boxcar safely reaches the rendezvous point and links up with the great artiste. But the third B-29, named Big Stink, is circling above at the wrong altitude and isn't seen. The planes circle and wait for 15 minutes, then 30 minutes, then 45 minutes. They had waited a full half hour longer than they were supposed to. Finally, Commander Dick Ashworth decides to move on with only the Great Artiste, which carried the instruments. The mission was already in jeopardy, and Ashworth could do without the photo plane. Boxcar arrives in Kokura only to find that the visibility is no longer sufficient due to the extended wait at the rendezvous point. Now with even less fuel, Boxcar turns to Nagasaki, the secondary target. Boxcar and the Great Artiste arrive in Nagasaki, 
36 minutes later, at 11.58, there is only enough fuel for one pass. The city is shrouded in clouds, but the crew only has one chance to drop the fat man. They spot a break in the cloud cover several miles from the city center. That's their chance, and they take it, dropping the bomb at high noon. At 12.06, the aircraft are headed back to Okinawa, but after several mishaps, they are dangerously low on fuel. For the next hour, the crew flies anxiously, fully aware of the possibility of having to ditch in the Pacific. The runway on Okinawa comes into view, but other planes are operating in the vicinity. Pilot Charles Sweeney fires flares and tries to radio ahead to announce their emergency landing. The warning goes unnoticed, but the plane has to land. Finally, at 1300, boxcar touches down in Okinawa. As it rolls down the runway, the number two engine runs out of fuel and shuts down. But they were on the runway and had not collided with any other planes. The mission to drop the second atomic bomb was far more harrowing compared to the first, but the mission was accomplished nonetheless. Three days later, on August 9, 1945, Emperor Hirohito decides to surrender unconditionally, and on September 2, the highest officials in the Japanese military formally surrender aboard the USS Missouri. Even during the surrender, the United States does not trust the seemingly irrational Japanese military, and American aircraft were stationed nearby to respond to any Hail Mary attacks the Japanese might have been plotting. If there was a plot, it did not come to fruition, and World War II ended that day on the deck of the Missouri.